Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us at the 10th anniversary edition of Expo Chicago, the International Exposition of Contemporary and Modern Art. I'm Kate Sears Potowski, Director of Programming, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues offers panel discussions, conversations, and provocative artistic discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on the current issues that engage them. This afternoon, join Carla Acevedo Yates, Marilyn and Larry Fields, curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art, for a conversation on her exhibition, Forecast Form, Art in the Caribbean Diaspora, 1990s to Today, which features artworks whose formal approaches reconfigure the relationship between identity and place through the lens of diaspora, displacement, and dispersal. Asavada Yates will be joined in conversation by contributing artists Suchitra Matai and Cosmo White. Asavada Yates was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and has worked as a curator, researcher, and art critic across Latin America, the Caribbean, and the United States. Forecast Forum will travel to the ICA Boston this year and to the MCA San Diego in 2024. This panel is presented in partnership with the Museum of the Contemporary Art Chicago, an art nexus, and will be followed by a book signing, a forecast form. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you so much, Kate, for that generous introduction, and thank you all for being here. I'm absolutely delighted to be talking about this show and to be joined by both Sutri Chamatai and Cosmo White, two artists that I deeply admire and whose work I'm really fortunate to be showing in forecast form at the MCA. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. We actually haven't seen each other since the opening, so it's a great way to close the show with this dialogue. Um, and I wanted to maybe perhaps start with um, the structure of the talk. So I'm going to talk about the show from a curatorial perspective for about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sutricha and Cosmo. We'll be talking about your work in the show. And um, then we'll be opening up for your questions. And one thing that I want to perhaps to start with is a question that I receive a lot is, how did the show start? How was the research? When did it start? And that's probably the most difficult question to answer because it feels like I've been thinking about this exhibition for a really long time. And it comes from a lot of different places. It comes from a lived experience. I grew up in Puerto Rico um, seeing exhibitions of Caribbean art. Um, so growing up in the context, um, but also seeing exhibitions of Caribbean art outside of Puerto Rico, um, living in the US for a really long time and having that experience of diaspora, of feeling like you're between two different places, between two different languages. So it comes from that experience. Um, but it also comes from, I would say, a historiography of exhibitions that I've seen and maybe some exhibitions that I haven't seen, um, that I've read the catalog, um, that I've had conversations with some of the curators. Um, and I can mention maybe Caribbean Crossroads of the World, Relational Undercurrents. There's so many shows that um, kind of had this like Caribbean group show that you know we've all seen kind of pop up every once in a while and now the Caribbean group show is kind of having a moment there's a bunch of them kind of popping up everywhere as well um, and one thing that always kind of struck me is that the shows are always trying to do something that seems impossible it's like what is the Caribbean where is it and they're trying to define it they're trying to represent it um, they're trying to account for its differences for its linguistic differences and I've always wanted to do a show like this, and I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to try to define it. I'm not going to try to represent it in that way. I'm not going to go to every island and see, like, there's one artist from this island and from the other. So I really wanted to do, you know, something um, that is different, that's thinking of how the Caribbean's really constituted by diaspora, by movement. And um, the whole concept of the show is um, thinking about movement, dispersal, um, physical displacement through different formal techniques. And another aspect that I think it's really important that I've been thinking about, I would say for a little over 10 years, um, is the work of Felix Gonzalez Torres, which for me has been incredibly influential and has been also influential for a lot of artists in the show. And Felix, um, he grew up in Puerto Rico, which is a fact that is not as well known um, in, as part of his biography. And one aspect of his work that I've always been really interested in is not only you know, his biography and all of the ideas that we already know really well, like the content of his work, 
But I was thinking about the structure of his work, like the conceptual structure of his work, how he structures his work conceptually. And there I've been thinking about the stack pieces, the candy pieces, like how you can take a piece of candy or a piece of paper and take it with you. So structurally how it works, um, how the work can travel, and that's a term that has been used by a lot of art historians and curators, that there's like a part of the work that travels around um, an exhibition, it travels with the viewer to their home. Um, and I wanted to think about it from another perspective of having a migratory structure. So in that way, I thought that those works instead of traveling, they had um, a structure that is migratory and that somehow reflected Felix's own biography as a migrant leaving Cuba and going to Spain and then coming back to Puerto Rico, going to New York, Miami, et cetera. So like how conceptually he structured his work in a way that was really personal. So coming from that, that work, there's like three works of Felix's in the show, um, if you've seen it. If not, please come by. It closes on April 23rd. And one of them is this one, um, untitled 1995. Um, it's a billboard project. Um, and it's actually the last work that was conceived by Felix before he passed away, but was never realized during his lifetime. So it's a really special, very special work. Um, and as part of those billboard projects, um, it's a work that is uh, bridging the thresholds between public and private space. So in a way, it's kind of transgressing those borders between what is private and what is public, which is something that he talks a lot about in his work. Um, and this work in particular is the first work in the show. It's the first work that you would encounter perhaps before arriving to the MCA. We had it here, what you see on the left is on a CTA station. Um, we worked with our incredible marketing team um, to realize this and the CTA. So we had this billboard um, sheet in over 20 CTA stations across Chicago. And as part of that, um, Felix stipulated that it had to be in diverse neighborhoods, so we really made sure that it was in different parts of the city. Um, and the idea was that you would counter this image coming to the MCA, and then you would come to the MCA and see the image again. So really thinking about the transport system as the circulatory system of the city, um, as what people you know travel and move from one place to the other, and what that means like structurally to come to the MCA um, and perhaps have an image that you've seen before that perhaps you didn't recognize that was an artwork. So this one on the left is um, at the Belmont station. On the right, um, it's on in the lobby on the fourth floor. And again, this image of a bird soaring in the sky that is very poetic, thinking about emancipation, the freedom of movement, um, the ability to not think about borders, nation states, and so on. So this work was um, really important to, to think about um, when entering the show. Then, I mean, there's so many works in the show, so I won't be able to go through them all, but um, this is another work that I would call part of the prologue of the show, including Felix's. So there's a, a very, um, two important works, um, an installation, a video installation by Deborah Jack, that is a commission that is also outside of the main galleries, and also a neon by Tavar Strong, who's an artist from the Bahamas, um, in broad daylight that also welcomes you before. And then there's this one, um, El Mar de Cristobal Colón, The Sea of Christopher Columbus by artist Alvaro Barrio. So this is a piece that you can see throughout the museum, um, but when you're coming into the galleries, you're seeing a part of the work. And then midway through the show, you see the other part, which is the red part. So again, um, there are over 50, I think more than 50 silk screen prints, and one side is blue and the other side is red. It's a very simple gesture but thinking about you know, what hides beneath the beauty of the Caribbean, which is, I think, a through line through a lot of um, the works in the show of thinking about the Caribbean Sea and the violence of colonialism, the violence of um, environmental destruction that you need to really look at deeply to, um, to understand and to see. So this concept of seeing is also very important. And, um, as part of the show, right at the beginning, um, when I was conceptualizing the exhibition, I was really thinking about this idea of the blackout. I think my, my colleague here, Iris, probably remembers when I was thinking about that. I really wanted to start the show and end the show with this idea of the powder outage as a concept or a metaphor for a type of context or condition that is very much of the region that, that says something about um, precarity or the turbulence of being in the Caribbean. Um, and um, when I was thinking about that, I'm like, I really, really want to work with an architect to 
realize this. And I contacted uh, Sketch Studio in Panama City, who was, was led by Johan Wolfshen, who's incredible. And I explained this idea to him that I wanted um, two dark spaces that were a little different from the rest of the show that somehow could um, lend itself to a different experience of how you would come into these galleries. And um, he came up with this concept uh, that you can see a little bit more here, um, which are these two plywood structures that are right at the beginning and the end of the show, what we call the bookends of the show. Um, and these plywood structures, when he came up with it, I thought it was really genius because it's a material that communicates a lot about a context. Um, it's very cheap. We got all of these materials from Ho Home Depot, actually, so it's very cheap, um, but it's very elegant as well. Uh, but it's, it's kind of uh, recalls ideas around shipping containers, um, crates, um, movement. Um, the smell of the plywood is very present in the galleries as well. Uh, it's thinking about an economic context, for example, boarding up houses before a hurricane. People use plywood um, sheets for that, but also even in um, economic distressful economic context, uh, folks board up their houses or their businesses, you know, when business is closed. So it said something about um, an economy that I thought was um, really interesting. And another thing that I was thinking really deeply is that I really wanted to start the show with video and photography and not painting. I, I had that very clear in my mind and that's why those rooms are kind of darker, especially the first one, because those are two tools like um, video and photography have been two tools that have been used um, historically to create this kind of fantasy or imaginary around the Caribbean. So instead of starting with painting, which would probably be the most obvious choice, like a colorful painting, I'm starting with um, video and photography um, as a way to kind of like uh, defy expectations of what you would find um, first. And this is, um, I'm skipping right to the end, but this is the other um, plywood structure that's right at the end of the show. And you have two works here um, by Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, which is an installation, Sugar Bittersweet. And then you have um, an Ana Mendieta photograph from our collection, and I'll, I'll take a moment to talk about that because I do get a lot of questions about the use of the Mendietas in the show. Um, and um, as part of uh, the exhibition, I wanted to include some works from our collection. And in particular, I was very drawn to Ana Mendieta because it's been an artist that's been influential for me as a curator, has been influential to a lot of artists in the show. And at the beginning, I, just, I was just gonna do a very normal, like let's put these five photographs together and um, at the time, I was reading um, Radical Virtuosity by um, Genevieve Hyacinth that's looking at Anna Mendieta from a Black Atlantic perspective, but I was also reading Where is Anna Mendieta um, by, I forget her name, um, Jane Blocker, I believe. It's like a very famous book. And um, I was thinking like, yeah, where is, she, where is she in these photographs? Because they're silhouettes, but her body's not there. There's certain photographs where she is there present, but the ones that I chose, she wasn't. And I'm like, what if I dispersed these photographs through the exhibition and sort of taking that same logic from Felix Gonzalez Torres of dispersal and um, translating that to a curatorial gesture. So thinking about um, how I could put those Mendietas in almost in every single section of the show that somehow she would um, be this quiet presence that would appear and disappear through the show. And the other thing that I was thinking was that it seems to me that her biography seems to um, be very heavy, like a heavy burden on her work, thinking about the very tragic circumstances around her death and all, all, everything about how she came to the United States and so on. So somehow, like, when you see the photograph, you think about that, but as you keep seeing them, like, the biography tends to, like, disappear in a way, and you start to see the work formally. And every single photograph relates in the show to two, one or two works um, formally that are in that same space. Um, this is the first vault. Um, you can see the um, Peter Doig painting, which is one of the first sight lines of the show when you come in, and it's very deliberate that I wanted this particular Peter Doig painting in this particular sight line. Um, Peter Doig is a Scottish artist that's been living in Trinidad since um, 2002. He painted this work in tw 2004, and it's the view from Naguago, Puerto Rico, of Monkey Island. And this is owned by um, a collector in San Juan. And um, 
Peter has not really been included in these Caribbean exhibitions, but I was really thinking why not include also artists that come from Europe or from the US that have established themselves in the region that have been living there for a while. And what does it mean? What kind of vision or perception do they have on the region? And in this one in particular, it's like the only tropical landscape of the show, so to speak. It's like So when you come in, it's this tropical landscape that slowly gets dismantled or disassembled as the show um, moves on. So that was like kind of the idea. But this work I love as well because it has these like vertical white brush strokes that make it seem like there's a curtain. So that Caribbean lush tropical landscape seems like a stage. Like it's like a stage. So like all of that beautiful lush landscape is like a stage for us, for the viewer, for the outside to kind of enjoy or to kind of like, um, to kind of, as a voyeur, to look at. So it was really um, important to have that work in the show. And then there's a, another Felix Gonzalez Torres entitled North. Um, there's a couple of works in, in here in this area that are thinking about geography otherwise. So like, how do you represent, so to speak, or approach a geography um, in other ways? So the North of Felix Gonzalez Torres, and then not pictured, there's a work by Angel Leonardo that's thinking of Himayaco, which is a region, um, uh, rural region in the Dominican Republic. Um, then when you go through the show, there's the, I wanted to think about ideas around movement. Um, and um, there's a really beautiful moment in the show of these two incredible women artists like kind of face to face with each other. Um, Celia Sanchez on the left with Lunar Con Tatuaje and Candida Alvarez with Breast Navel Eye. And um, Celia Sanchez is an artist that I deeply admire that's been um, a professor for many generations of, of Puerto Rican um, painters and, and sculptors and, and so on for Puerto Rican artists um, and very influential to me. And this work in particular is very important in her, um, her larger practice because the drawing that you see on top of the painting is looking at all of her dis physical displacements from Cuba to Puerto Rico to New York. So she closes her eyes and is thinking about how she has migrated through all of these different um, places um, within her life. And then Candida Alvarez, a very beloved artist here in Chicago, who I'm very fortunate also to call a personal friend. Um, and we all perhaps know her very colorful abstract paintings, so we wanted to really dig deep and find something that perhaps was a little different and unexpected. Um, and uh, the research team um, found this work, um, Breast Naval Eye, from the early 90s. And during the 90s, she had all these um, works that were thinking about circles. Like um, there's a circle project from the late 90s, like a performance that she did in New York. Um, and this is a print that's related um, to that series of works. I think I'm running out of time. Um, but here um, you can see a little bit about, like I wanted to kind of think about color because when you come into the show, it's pretty neutral. Like so there's not that, maybe perhaps that colorful entrance that you would see in a Caribbean show if you're thinking about the Caribbean. So um, we have this beautiful painting um, by Tom Elsai, who I see um, in the audience. Hi, Tom. <laughs> um, Frank Bowling and a Denzel Forrester, and then um, a Sandra Brewster mural that is picturing um, Wilson Harris, a Guyanese writer. Um, and Sandra's work is really important as well because it's thinking about printmaking as a technique and what it can communicate about identity formation. So what she's thinking about is when you transfer information from one surface to the other, like what gets lost and what you gain, and that is a really beautiful metaphor for how people gain things and lose things at the same time when you migrate. So I thought it was really um, a really nice way to frame um, that part of the exhibition. Um, and then we continue to um, an area that um, that is called exchanges in the exhibition, but now I've, I've come to understand it as like geographic dislocation now that the show has been running for quite some time. Um, and we have works by Christopher Cozier, a very important artist um, based in Trinidad, who's a personal friend of a lot of us in the exhibition, um, and Alia Farid. And I want to stop at Alia Farid's work just for a moment because of this idea of like how geography can be dislocated in the sense that certain images or iconographies or certain sounds that we might associate with a place are actually not from that place. And, and what does that mean, right? So when you see this, this work, it's a prayer rug that you might associate with the Arab world, but it's actually made by a Puerto Rican Kuwaiti artist 
who's taking um, pictures of mosque architecture throughout the Caribbean. What she does is taking these photographs, she sends them to Iran, um, and the weavers interpret these photographs into these um, beautiful prayer rugs. And um, Christopher Cozier, again, um, with uh, Gasman that was filmed here in Lake Michigan as, as part of a residency at Northwestern um, that has a, a sound that perhaps you would um, associate with India, but it's actually Trinidadian music because of the Indian migration to Trinidad. And I will be, I think I have a little bit more. <laughs> um, I wanted to conclude my remarks um, with this image here, which is um, at the last fall of the show, um, two artists that I deeply admire again, Teresita Fernandez and Fidele Baez, um, which actually have never shown together, which was kind of egregious. <laughs> um, but it's been, it's a really moment, a very important moment in the show, not because you have all these like very strong women artists and they've never shown together because of what this image represents um, of the palm tree um, within the context of, of the Caribbean, which as many of you know, is not a, a plant that is it's not endemic to the region. So we know, don't know really from where it's from. But one thing I wanted to mention before I pass it on to um, Suchitra and Cosmo is that um, I've come to realize now that the show is closing very soon, um, how much of an intergenerational dialogue there is between artists. For example, like even Teresita and Fierle that have been friends for so long, never shown together. Um, very much in, interested in very similar themes, but um, from two different generations showing in the same space. Um, there were artists that have shown together but hadn't shown together in a really long time. There's artists that have been influential to each other. I can think of um, Keith Piper to Deborah Jack, um, Celia Sanchez to Alia Farid, um, Ana Mendieta to Alia, and to, to many other artists in the show. Um, and even thinking of you two now, um, Cosmo and Suchitra, you both um, share like a building, like you have your studio in the same building. And I know that Cosmo, um, you gave a talk with Teresita and you sent me like a picture, you were together there. So it was really interesting how an exhibition can bring people together and create like a community of artists that um, kind of like transcends the exhibition. And that's something that I'm really interested in right now of how these, these group shows can create not only like a temporary community, but can, can create networks that will transcend the exhibition. And how, would, how, is, that, how is this gonna look like you know, moving forward um, as we continue to work together and to talk, um, to be in conversation. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, that was a very quick overview of the show. I hope you go and see it. Um, it's closing soon, but I wanted to um, turn it over um, to Suchitra. Um, I'm going to hand this here. Yeah. I'm hand it over to you. Um, this is Suchitra's piece, um, An Ocean's Cradle. Um, and I, uh, this piece is really important in this area of the show because it's thinking about materiality, like what the importance and what materials can communicate. Um, about a context, about a history. And one material that has been really important for you is the sari. And I'm wondering if you can talk, start talking about the sari as a material and when did you start using this material in your work? Of course. Um, I just want to say that it's been a pleasure to be part of this exhibition. Um, it's been an honor to show with many of the artists in it. So just begin with that. Um, in terms of the saris, well, my practice is multidisciplinary. And I'm, you know, always using new materials, different materials, and I'm telling stories through those materials. And so the saris were first used for the Sharjah Biennial uh, in 2019. And what I was searching for there um, was the material that would somehow bring together uh, South art, artists, I mean, people of the, women of the South Asian diaspora, um, you know, over uh, topography and through time. And I think one of the things I've been thinking a lot about um, in terms of the exhibition is this idea of, um, you know, dislocation, uh, not having a fixed point when you migrate so many times, um, you know, there's this, sort of transitional, continually transitional state of being uh, in terms of identity and that 
Uh, again, there are some things that you lose, some things that you gain. Uh, but my family is from Guyana. I didn't say that. But um, Guyana has a large Indo-Caribbean population. And after slavery um, ended in the 1800s, uh, the British and other um, European colonizers uh, basically brought, um, the, the British specifically in the case of India, brought um, poor Indians uh, or lured poor Indians to uh, Guyana, Trinidad, and other areas uh, that are considered the Caribbean uh, to be indentured laborers. And so that's the history of my family. Um, both my parents are of South Asian descent, and uh, the Saris have always been uh, a part of my family in terms of ritual. I remember getting, uh, having my first sari, you know, and they're passed down from uh, family members. And so a lot of my work, um, I didn't say this, but deals with the domestic, uh, you know, uh, materials and processes that uh, are generally and have been associated with women's work and, and um, or the work of women and also um, of the domestic. So things, you know, I use a lot of um, embroidery or weaving or, um, you know, uh, thinking about um, textiles and uh, other processes like that. So basically the saris, back to the saris, um, they were a way, again, of bringing together uh, these women. They're often you know, gifted to me. Uh, they're sourced in India and from around the world. Uh, my mom and her family and her friends uh, give them to me, send them to me quite regularly. But what they really are for me is, in a way, um, they're of the body, right? They're, they hold memories. Um, and there's an absence and a presence uh, that's within them, lies within them. And so when I cut them and weave them, I, it's weaving in, weaving in the loosest of senses. It's a, a process I've come up with um, on my own. So it only tangentially relates to the, um, the act of weaving. Uh, but, you know, for me, they're deeply personal. And a lot of the tapestries that I make have... Uh, a personal element, like a sari from my family. And that becomes really um, an important way of speaking uh, to the ancestors, uh, but also telling stories that are of a personal um, uh, you know, nature. And I think that for, uh, for this work, An Ocean's Cradle, um, I really wanted, uh, I, you know, I knew that I was going to use saris and um, I have a whole story related to that. I don't know if you want me to move on to that, but. I would love for you to talk about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll start with the, the title, um, An Ocean's Cradle. So of course, ocean as, um, you know, a place of migration, as the site of migration, um, you know, in a way, a site of, of course, violence, a site of history, um, but also a sort of really poignant metaphor uh, for disorientation and that disorientation that you feel when you move through, um, when you migrate from one place to another and uh, live between multiple cultures, as many people do in the Caribbean. And so uh, there's the idea of cradle as well, and the kind of care uh, and safety of a cradle for an infant, but then also uh, thinking about cradle in terms of the cradle of civilization or a place of origin. And so, you know, I'm, the stories I tell are based on oral tales that have been handed down to me by my uh, you know, family, my grandfather, etc. And so for this particular work, I wanted it to be um, a story, stories that were materially told, right? And I, I know that you mentioned that in that part of the exhibition, a lot of artists are speaking through or telling stories through materials. And what I wanted to um, 
sort of conjure uh, was this notion of conflict um, within the work. So through color and form, uh, there's an interaction, a kind of uh, tension and a force or forces that are coming together, but also um, working against uh, one another. And so it becomes very much landscape, um, you know, in, in, a, in a way, uh, but it also holds um, other materials like the gungaroos. Uh, my family, both of my sisters uh, studied uh, classical Indian dance and the, the gungaroos, the bells, are, are, the, um, are bells that you would wear on your feet. Uh, on your ankles, rather, when you're when you're dancing, and so they become another material that um, adds to the story. And so, what you know, it's the ocean. It's the um, as a point of departure and a and a site of um, conflict, but also a place for freedom. I think, and that's something. Uh, you know, it has the the kind of um, it's like a it's like a site where anything can happen, and I think in terms of your exhibition and you know what we've been talking about, this idea that there's not a fixed time or a, f a fixed place when we think about the Caribbean, um, this is something that I was thinking about for for this work. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm always curious about the amount of saris that you use because I know you produce a lot and I know that there's several works that have like a sari from your mother, for example, which is mm -hmm. really meaningful. Um, does this one have a particular one that is meaningful to your family? And the other question is, um, how do you actually source all these materials? <laughs> yes, so the bulk of the saris um, I source in India, uh, but all of my materials that I use are either there's kind of a combination. They're either sourced, um, found, or uh, gifted, which is a beautiful thing. And so I have these kind of piles, uh, special piles, of personal saris. Uh, so yes, in this one, there is a personal sari in all of them. Um, but then also saris that are gifted to me from strangers and, and from family and friends. And so in terms of the number, that's a hard thing to um, to think about because I kind of work frenetically, and you know, um, there's there are bins and bins of colors and saris, and you know, I didn't really explain the process, but I, I cut them um, and then weave them through a grid, and that's how I I, I make them. Uh, but yes, I don't have a number for you, but. <laughs> There's a lot. That's I like remember the last, the last the one question. we did, I saw a lot of bins of uh, sorry, so that was very revealing to me. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to talk about before um, moving on to Cosmo is yeah. how do you relate this, this sorry work to your larger practice? Um, and I know that you have many other images that we can look oh, at. Oh, yes, sorry. I forgot um, about the images. Yeah, there's a few other images that we can, um, that you can look at, that we can think about. Um, because this, I know that you started using the bells quite recently. Um, yes, yes, yes. And so um, originally, I made a work called Imperfect Isometry for the Sharjah Biennial. And I wanted to create, the reason I created uh, the tapestries then, um, they were just one part of three. Uh, I think. Let's talk about this one a little bit, because yeah. this is kind of like, Kind of like, I mean, you're going off the wall and creating like a structure. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about this one in particular? Um, so this one uh, is called uh, Siren Song. And it was at the John Michael Kohler Art Center. Uh, and it just actually returned to my studio. But I have been thinking a lot about sculpture and you know, tapestries are one of the, the kind of modes of operation in my studio, but sculpture is, a, is really important to me as well, and, and kind of thinking about how to make these forms more itinerant, you know, in the way that, you know, thinking about the Caribbean and forms that are constantly in, in flux. Um, and so this was one of the first works I made that was dimensional three-dimensional and so what is going on here is that 
I wanted a space for viewers to enter um, that felt different than the exterior. And so the exterior are woven saris and fabric, and then the interior are actually braids of saris, made from saris. And so the braids, of course, reference the braids that um, you know Indian women wear, I wore as a child. Uh, and then when you walk into the space, there's a video projection of the Atlantic Ocean. And so uh, a number of years ago, I was able to cross uh, the passage from Ghana to Brazil. And it, you know, sort of um, mimicked the passage of my ancestors. And I took a lot of video, and I knew it was going to be important to me for my work. And so in this particular work, when you enter, there's a projection of the Atlantic Ocean um, made on that voyage and that crossing. And what happens as you enter and as you're in the space is that it feels like a womb because there's the sound of the ocean and the darkness. Um, and so I'm really interested you know, my work takes many different forms, many different medias. The saris have become an integral part um, of the work because they are so much about my past. They hold su such rich history. They hold memories. They hold smells. They are, um, and they're also of labor. You know, I didn't mention that earlier, but um, I use saris that are of the everyday, that are worn by women, you know, making rotis, cooking, cleaning, and they're not um, saris for rituals, uh, fancy saris, as my mom would say. So uh, ver they're very much about labor, and they're, you know, they're very much about um, the everyday and celebrating that labor of women. I really want to experience this work because what you described from the that voyage that you took seems so personal and so meaningful and how you translate that um, into a materiality or an experience. It seems um, really, really beautiful. It was a very emotive I'm sure. experience. Yeah. I'm sure. Thank you, Suchitra, for sharing that. Um, I think now we're going to... Um, turn it to Cosmo, if you can just give the clicker to Cosmo. Um, so Cosmo, mm -hmm. um, your work in the show, um, let's, go to let's go forward a bit. Do you want to start with the work in the show? Sure, we can yeah. start with the work in the show. Your work in the show, um, the materiality is very important, of course the imagery, but also structurally, it has a very particular function because I know you're interested in this idea of the archive and sort of piercing the archive, like how do you enter an archive and what of that means. Mm -hmm. And your, your work is positioned right way in the midpoint of the exhibition, mm -hmm. where there's a, sh a shift in tone, I would say, in the show, yeah. that's really thinking about how artists are using archival images or creating their own images. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to start with, um, with you talking about the series of works, the curtain works that you've been working, and then um, this one in particular, Beyond the Boundary. Okay. So um, the curtain works, it, it was an idea that started a long, long time ago. And it was one of those things where it felt just too far-fetched. I didn't have the resources yet. And it's something I tabled until 2019 when I had a solo show at a Museum of Contemporary Art in Georgia. And I knew I wanted a piece that um, would have the viewer um, really question themselves spatially and to navigate and think about themselves within the space. And so I, I had been doing all of these drawings that were engaging with the archive in some shape or form. Um, a lot of these drawings were based on some kind of archival research. And one of the things that I kept bumping up against as I was looking at all of these archival images was the role of the photographer in shaping the discourse around this particular event or region. And I, I, I felt the drawings were doing something else, but they weren't um, interrogating the role of the photographer and disrupting that kind of 
uh, intrusive gaze of the camera. And I was thinking about the camera also as, and how it has been used in ethnographic research um, and a, an extension of the colonial project and all of this stuff. So I, that's how the curtain came about. I thought, like, I want a piece where you, the viewer, with your body, will go through and disrupt momentarily the legibility of this image. Um, but also, you'll have an opportunity to literally feel the piece. It's, you don't often get a chance to touch artwork. And I wanted you to feel the weight of the curtain because it's metal beads. Um, the curtain themselves are based on uh, curtains that are in domestic spaces in the Caribbean, oftentimes separating the kitchen from the, the living room. Um, and I've always been fascinated that, with them as this idea of a threshold. So for me, the archive now becomes both a threshold but also a site for disturbance. Um, this particular piece is, uh, is part of an ongoing series where um, I'm making this, this work around cricket, which is a very odd uh, colonial sport, um, but something that is actually quite dear to me. My father used to take me to um, the cricket fields in Jamaica, particularly Sabina Park, which is also where Jamaica's independence ceremony took place. And I have a series of drawings around that pivotal threshold moment. Um, but I remember specifically being at the cricket field, and the game goes on forever. It's like five days, um, starts in the morning, you end at five. It's like a work, work day, right? But what I always found fascinating as a child was being in the stands and hearing the adults talk. And I found it very fascinating because you'd hear conversations about what's happening in apartheid South Africa, Nelson Mandela, uh, Mugabe, and the disappointment of him moving from liberator to dictator. And so it was this political discourse that was happening in the stands. So I'm making these series of works on and off where I'm interested in cricket, but not so much what's happening on the pitch but what's happening in the stands. Um, and then the term blackwash was used whenever the West Indian cricket team, which I may add is the only thing the English speaking Caribbean does as a unified front. Um, whenever the team beats, does a sweep of a series, it's typical, typically called a whitewash, but um, in a Caribbean context, in the West Indian cricket context, it's referred to as a blackwash. So I also, um, these banners became this political statement. Um, and this image is taken, um, is based on an image from Lord's Cricket Field in England um, during the 1980s. And I'm thinking about just what cricket meant to that diaspora community in England. Um, and yeah, so, you know, that's, that's where that was coming from. Yeah. And it's titled after um, oh, yes, the book by C.L.R. Yes. James. C.L.R. James, yes, yeah, yeah. And thinking about his scholarship and how he was able to contextualize cricket as more than just a sport. Um, and so tying back to my experience of being in those, um, in those stands, listening to the political discourse that's happening, and understanding even as a child that this is not just a sport. Yes, we may have a particular pride in beating England, but there's something else that is happening here that I needed years to unpack as an adult. And wait, what are we looking at here, um, Cosmo? This yeah. is part of the same series? Yeah, this is part of the same series of curtains. So this one is called Waiting in the Wake. And I did this piece just before moving to Florida. And this piece is of a, um, a demonstration between segregationalists and black swimmers on St. Augustine Beach. and for this particular piece, I was going back to this idea of the, the role of the photographer, um, but also utilizing these kind of um, photographic frameworks. So I'm cropping the image, um, zooming in on a particular interaction, and I, I wanted an image that um, was slippery in terms of, is it play, is it protest? I can't quite tell. Um, and I always find it interesting whenever um, a viewer encounters the curtains, there's always a moment of pause and a negotiation of, especially for the first encounter, do I go through this, do I touch it? What is this image that I'm seeing? Um, and yeah, so this one was at uh, an Edby gallery in LA, which is the gallery that represents me. 
Um, uh, yeah, and then there's drawings on the other side that further contextualize the image or puts it in dialogue with other things. So in this case, it was um, Im drawings of both more legible or easily understandable images of protest, but then also images from West in the West Indian Day Parade in, um, in New York. Um, yeah, so. I, I want to go back what you talked about the viewer going through them because yeah. I think that's a really important um, part of your work. It's yeah. very participatory. Mm -hmm. um, how do you envision, because a lot of the images that you choose are actually um, representations of bodies yeah. and there's like a body that is moving through the curtain. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about how you envision that experience of um, possibly a body moving through the space while at the same time disrupting the legibility of an image mm -hmm. that perhaps they're unaware of, like right. what is exactly represented? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, that initial contact is very interesting to me. That moment where, um, and it started, this was the very first one that I did, and I, I was interested in what happens if I take an image of a protest um, and this is the first thing that the viewer is going to encounter. What is the negotiation that happens here? Um, is this something that you want to walk through? What does it mean to walk through it? And as you walk through it, um, it will disrupt the image, but also you're gonna feel the weight of it. But another thing that's important to me is there's, there's a sound that happens, there's a clanging of the beads, there's a weight of the beads, but you're also, as traffic goes through it, you're chipping away at the image as well. So there's another archive that is being created of the body moving through the image. Um, so these were some of the things that I was um, thinking through as I was, I was creating them. And I also wanted uh, to, this, to, to think through this question of agency. What does it mean if I say it to the viewer, okay, the, the image will stay intact unless you decide to disrupt it. Um, and then through the act of disrupting it, something else is happening. Your body is now becoming implicated or a part of it. And in this particular piece, there was information about the image on the other side once you entered. Um, and I'm always being very clear, source um, stating this is based on an image from such and such a place, from such and such a location. Um, yeah. I, I have to ask, is there like an art historical reference to Felix Gonzalez Torres? There, Tell yes, me about yes, this, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah, so thinking about his curtains um, and, uh, and you know, as I was trying to think about what, um, how I wanted to create a new kind of engagement with the, with the, um, with the archive, I was going through my studio and I, I picked up one of his books and I remember seeing the curtain and thinking, maybe, maybe this is some kind of way of, of engaging, maybe there's a conversation that could happen here. So that's, um, that's kind of where it started. Me, and yeah. I, I really love how the work has this, it has that art historical reference, but there's like domestic, right, kind of yeah. very situated yeah. reference to like a Jamaican yeah. home or a Caribbean mm -hmm. home, oh, yeah. and like mm -hmm. how those two mm -hmm. are not mutually exclusive, which exactly. you might think they yeah. are. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that is also like in Felix's work, like mm -hmm. the light string pieces, yeah. people tend to like think about all of these different things like minimalisms and so on and, and everyday objects and how he used them, which is true. Mm -hmm. um, but there's another interpretation of that, which is like thinking about um, the lights of, a, of, of like a street festival right. in, in, in Havana or in San Juan or anywhere in the Caribbean. Those lights are, are put overhead. Right. Um, so there's also that sort of very idiosyncratic reference to that. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you're, you're also thinking yes. of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is not even a tension. I feel like they're both Kind of, it's like a productive conversation between those two that adds something really interesting to any formal reading, right, yeah. mm -hmm. right, of your work or of his work. It enhances that formal reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask before we um, go to questions, maybe one one last question for you both. Um, just about like the context of your works in the show, um, briefly, because I know we have to go on to questions, but if you could um, just talk really briefly about um, how you experienced 
the Caribbean group show yourself because it's something that we're all always like thinking about and um, perhaps we don't want to be like labeled or categorized within a particular narrative and I'm very sensitive to that as well um, and just maybe briefly some words about um, now in retrospect seeing the show like um, what has been like one one thing that has been um, kind of comes up for you um, thinking about your work within the, a larger context of a group show. Um, actually, it's interesting that you should ask. Um, <laughs> no, no, because actually something that um, Magda brought up um, in her talk, right, yeah. um, this, um, I just have it written down because I'm jet lagged. Um, where is it? Oh, yes. Glissant's uh, right to opacity. opacity. Mm -hmm. That is something that I have been thinking about a lot because um, you know, the idea of to not be fully comprehended and apprehended mm -hmm. is something that I feel as though I've wanted <laughs> um, my whole life because I've, I've lived in um, non, a lot of non-Caribbean spaces and um, you know, I was born in Guyana but lived throughout North America and India and whatnot. But um, I think, like for me, I think people who interact with me always think that I'm maybe second generation South Asian. And so there's always this sort of, you know, these kind of assumptions that are made. Um, but, you know, I'm not and there's like, a different history there, and I think this idea that one can defy mm -hmm. the stereotypes, that one should be able mm -hmm. to, that one should have, um, you know, to not be, one should not be subjected to this type of gaze, um, you know, and that's something that has stuck with me from the show. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I was, I'll start before the exhibition because we had a conversation and um, I, I, I was very relieved and very happy to hear about you talking about your apprehensions of just the way in which um, these kind of shows can box you into this corner and, and your goal for, for it to not be like that. Um, uh, there were definitely moments walking through the show and I ha have now had an opportunity to see it multiple times, um, but one, being in community with other Caribbean artists um, and seeing how they're internalizing uh, similar themes or you, you talk about Glissant, Glissant is, somewhat, is a scholar that is, is very dear to me in my own thinking too, Stuart Hall along the line, but being able to see echoes of that in other artists and and seeing the ways in which they're internalizing that and bringing that, those poetics out into their work um, w was very, very uh, enriching for me to, 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 to understand my work in dialogue with, with these other folks, but um, also see the different ways in which these, these themes, these ideas can be embodied in, in a person in the art and all of that stuff. So that was great. But then I have to go to the, uh, that reception, the dinner, and just that kind of energy, the camaraderie, the, um, it, it felt really refreshing. It felt, um, yeah, kind of. I don't know how to describe yeah, it, yeah, but it was, the opening yeah. was so incredibly mm -hmm. energetic and I don't want to say loud, but w it was like yeah. kind of like just lively. I don't yeah. know. There's like a, I'm trying to find a word to describe it, but yeah, no, it was lively, but it was just warm. Yeah, as well. Yeah. It just it? felt like very, also very casual. It didn't mm. feel like an art opening. Yeah. It just felt like a, a big celebration. Yeah. It was like very joyous. Yeah. yeah, it was very joyous. And unabashedly celebrating one another, because I remember like going up to Deborah Jack and be like, "You knocked that out of the park. That's amazing." Yeah, but it's. Yeah, it was just such a, a, a wonderful moment to just recognize and see each other and be like, because we're so dis dispersed. Dispersed, yeah. Yeah, so it's, a, it's this moment to, 
like say I see you, I see what you're doing. I see you, and yeah. you're you're yeah. so great. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like a moment of like recognition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both yeah. so much. Yeah. Thank um, you. Thank I think we're ready to take any questions. If you, um, if there's any questions, we're ready to answer them. Celia, I think the mic is coming your way. Uh, one question is, um, I think uh, there are some artists in the show that maybe, from what I have read, have not been in the Caribbean or are not part of the Caribbean. Is there any specific, am I right or? So that's a good question because what I'm, I think what I'm trying to get at is that it's very difficult to define the Caribbean and that perhaps it's not located in a geography that's fixed, but in a shared history. And that's where the, the Filipino artist, David Medaya, maybe you're, you're referencing. That's kind of in the midway point of the show. It's, it's in proximity to, um, to Cosmo's work and to Alvaro Barrio's work. That um, apart from having this kinetic sculpture that's creating its own forms um, every day, so every day it looks different, but also thinking about a shared history that the Philippines has, a colonial history with the Caribbean, and even with the US, and sort of thinking about history as a way to um, think about identity outside of a geographic lens. So that's kind of like where, where that approach was. And I'm really interested in expanding those latitudes, so to speak, and perhaps even going further than that. Um, and there's an art, another artist, um, Adam Vallecillo, who is not Caribbean. He's um, from Honduras, but his work was made in Panama. So it's, it's like kind of thinking about like in a very different way. Sometimes, um, oftentimes, these shows go to a biography of an artist to see if they can be in the show. Like, oh, he was born in Jamaica, was born in Puerto Rico, his parents were from this place. I think I'm looking at it from a different perspective. It's more of like, if the work has some relation to the region, or if there's a shared history that um, can expand our understanding of what the Caribbean is or what Caribbean Caribbeanness could be. And, and well, I have two more questions. <laughs> and these are for the artists. <clears throat> when we speak about Latin American art, we can define very easily Latin American. But sometimes, like, the artist is born in one place but spends most of his time outside of that place, like um, New York or England, how can you, I mean, how the Caribbean persists in your life being from, for example, your, your background from India? Is it really present or, or not? I, I think it's different for every individual. Um, I grew up Hindu, eating Indian food, and um, but also very Caribbean listening to Calypso and different types of music that were, you know, throughout the Caribbean. Um, you know, there's this always, there's always this desire to find community. So I, I lived in Nova Scotia. That was the first place my family moved to. And we belonged to a Caribbean association. And so there was this, there's always this desire um, you know, depending on where we were, but we also had South Asian friends, you know. So there were, there's always this desire to kind of um, keep the culture alive, whatever that means, you know, or keep a culture alive or keep multiple cultures alive. And so, um, yeah, so there, it is very present, both um, the South Asia portion, but also the Caribbean portion. I, I think the Caribbean is an interesting place because it, it embodies multiplicity. It, it kind of rejects this kind of essentialism. Um, and I can speak specifically of Jamaica. They're, they're the same amount of Jamaicans living on the island as they are in the larger diaspora. So migration has always been embodied in what it means to be of the Caribbean. So, um, so I, at this point in my life, I've lived just as much time in Jamaica as I have in um, in the states, and yes, there's this kind of existential crisis that comes with 
migration, but I also understand that this is a very particular Caribbean story. Um, so I don't, the tension of am I Caribbean enough, am I Jamaican enough doesn't exist in that kind of way. Um, uh, but I also recognize that I am becoming something. I mean, we're all in the process of becoming, right? But I am becoming something other than just this individual who had lived on this island for the majority of their life, and, and that is fine. And the work then reflects that dual, or even several different locations, yeah. It, uh, we have time for one more question. Hi, uh, thank you guys, by the way, for a beautiful talk, congratulations. Um, but my question has to do with the sort of translation of the show as it's going to be traveling. So much of what you've talked about during the show is this idea of like dispersal and just, you know, everything becoming disparate and falling apart and coming together in new ways. And having seen the show in person, and I encourage everyone here to go see it if you get a chance, because so much of it is very specific to the space. And so I'm curious how you as artists and the curator are thinking about the way that the show will change in its formats as it moves to other places. You know, are you gonna continue the, uh, you know, the, the pieces that are the billboard projects or those site-specific works uh, to the, uh, the installation? How does that shift as you're imagining the literal diaspora of this show? Thanks, Stefan, for that question. That's a great question. And I think the show will necessarily be different. And again, like what I was speaking about, that, that you lose things and gain things along the way, I think the show itself will also lose some works along the way and perhaps gain some works. And it will look very different. I'm really interested in collaborating with my colleagues at both institutions because they know their spaces better than I do. And I'm really excited to see what we come up with together. Um, but there are some works that will not translate probably the Felix Gonzalez Torres billboard will be very specific to Chicago. And it's true that a lot of my choices, because I believe that curatorial practice is a spatial practice, like it's very difficult to translate these ideas that I developed for the MCA's fourth floor to kind of just kind of plop them or transplant them into another space. It seems like that would be really irresponsible of me. Um, so necessarily it will, it will change, but I think that's, that's really generative. And even because these sections in the show, they're not um, kind of isolated, distinct sections, I designed them in the way that they're porous, just like this idea around movement and things like that, that even new juxtapositions for both of you, I think that would be really great to see moments in the show where there's a legibility of, or a trace of what the show was at the MCA, and then that it can, get, it can gain a new identity in certain moments of the show that is very specific to Boston or very specific to San Diego. Um, so I'm really excited to, to really see that unfold. All right, well, thank you so much. This is a great crowd. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.